Hi, my name is Leif Rasmussen. I work at the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about a recent survey of Oregon's nearshore midwater rockfish that we've been doing. So why midwater rockfish? What I have here is a plot of the economic value of the recreational fisheries in Oregon. The x-axis is year, and the y-axis is the actual value of those fisheries. And while the iconic fisheries like halibut and tuna represented on the right are here, their value is actually relatively low. But if you look at the top left and look at bottom fish, you can see that there's a large economic value to this fishery that persists year in and year out. So what is a bottom fish? What I have here on the x-axis is the number of fish that are caught, and the y-axis are the different fish species that are landed. And those bottom fish fisheries are really made up of black rockfish. And as you can see here, the big bars right in the middle are black rockfish. They are the bread and butter of our recreational fishing fleet. They're the main focus, and they have a huge economic uh, importance to the coastal communities. And if you remember back to 2017, we had to shut down the black rockfish fishery. It's because we attained our quotas. Um, if you look at the top right, I have a plot from our stock assessment models. The x-axis is year, the y-axis is uh, metric tons, which is our quota. And what happens is we do these modeling exercises, and it tells us how many fish we're allowed to catch. And as we go beyond year after year away from when we do the stock assessment model, we reduce our quotas slowly to be more sure that we aren't overfishing on accident. So what we need to do is we need to redo this stock assessment model. However, a model is only as good as the data that goes into it, and we have no counts of black rockfish that are independent of our fisheries being used. So here's a cartoon of an um, idealized rocky reef. You can see there's many rockfish and other species living there. And if you've been out fishing, you know you can drive around with your boat, use your fish finder, and you can look for schools of fish that then you can target using hook and line. Um, however, because we do live in Oregon, we're fortunate to have this great diversity of fish on our reefs. Um, so that may make you think, oh, it's going to be really hard to differentiate what species you're seeing with something like a fish finder. What's cool, though, is, is that a fish finder actually struggles to see fish right on the bottom. So only those fish above it, those midwater rockfish, are the ones that we can see. So the acoustics are actually a very efficient and great way for us to count those spe species. So if on the top left, what you have is some data from our acoustics. If I have this data, I can collect it, but I, and I can turn it into a number of fish. But to do so, I need to know what proportion of species there are out there, basically how many blacks to blue deacons are the ratio, if you will, and the size of those fish. There's an important uh, relationship I need to know there. So we designed this suspended underwater camera system you see on the top right that has two cameras that look forward at the same image from just slightly different angles. If you use two cameras looking at the same image from different angles, you can actually get a length. You put all that data together with some models that I have, and I can give you a population estimate. This is awesome. We did this, we tested this with our habitat team and other folks, and it's effective, it's efficient, it works great. So we went to ODFW's Restoration and Enhancement Board, and they were generous enough to give us funding so we could actually go ahead and get the survey on the water and test it out and see how it worked on a full statewide scale. A whole bunch of contracting problems and COVID problems later, we actually started this survey in August. I was very fortunate that I had a crew who was all willing to be vaccinated, um, quarantine, and do all the COVID protocols um, to make it so we could do this in a really safe and wonderful way that um, really made it so it was effective. So we left this year on uh, August 1st. Um, we worked out the Pacific Surveyor, this vessel you can see on the lower left. Um, and we worked from the Washington border to the California border. Um, down on the southern Oregon coast, in and amongst wash rocks, we used this arima you can see on the top right uh, to work in tight where that bigger boat couldn't go. The middle picture shows you our two transducers on this large steel pole that we use to actually collect the data. And the top left kind of shows you what our transects look like. Um, we have transects, like I said, from Washington to California. We mostly survey over known rocky reef habitat, though every 15 kilometers from uh, border to border, we did a sampling st uh, transect from 80 meters water depth to the near shore. So we could uh, look at kind of this true synoptic statewide scale. Um, this is our main thing. Like I said, this is an acoustic survey. This is kind of our wheelhouse. Well, not truly the wheelhouse. Wheelhouse is above us. But this is where we uh, sat. We spent all of our days looking at data. You can see in the top right photo, the uh, acoustics in the top right, a database that we were using in real time, our navigation in the center, and our CTD in the top. All this data we sent up to the wheelhouse so that the captain could see things. Um, 
Here's that camera system I was talking about. We haul it using a commercial crab block. And there's a cartoon on the left that kind of shows. It floats up about two meters off the bottom into these schools of fish that we identify and target using the camera system. So just kind of here would be the principles as we're going along. I'm watching the fish finder in the top right. You can see that there's a school of fish. I radio up to the captain. I make a mark on my trot plotting software. I say, hey, I want to drop the camera. The deck crew scrambles. My crew scrambles. We get the cameras turned on. We get everything set up. The camera goes over the side like you can see on the left. And we send it into the fish school to sample for a couple of minutes. Um, in addition to doing these video camera drops, we also did CTD casts. Um, from an acoustic standpoint for us, we need to know the speed of sound in water, which is really important for uh, making sure that the acoustics are accurate. But we also got to look at oxygen, turbidity, a number of things from all of Oregon's near shore waters. This really synoptic, really wonderful data set we've been building. Um, in addition, we also did hook and line sampling uh, twice a day. And then we used uh, a bunch of sampling tools. So we got lengths, weights of every individual fish. We took otoliths for age. We took maturity samples. So we have this big um, fish in hand data set that also goes along with this. Um, so what do we do? We just finished this uh, survey. We spent 44 days at sea. We completed 595 transects. And we covered 3,570 kilometers of uh, habitat. We fished 48 stations, caught 580 fish. We did 507 video drops and 229 CTD casts. This is a huge and massive amount of data set. We have over 10 terabytes of data that we now need to process. Um, what we also got to do and what we got to see is we got this really wonderful nearshore look of Oregon. And since the state of coast, I thought people would appreciate kind of what we got to see and all these things that many people in Oregon don't get to see. So here's one of the three arch rocks up nice and close. Then that night, we got to anchor at the base of Cape Lookout. A couple days later, we're anchored up at Cascade Head here. Moving down along the Oregon dunes, we saw blue whales and other whales feeding down here. We then pulled into Nellie's Cove to launch that small boat I was telling you about. And then you get these iconic experiences just moving along the Oregon coastline. Um, you know, not only just from a scientific standpoint, but just from a personal standpoint, we got to see all sorts of great things. But back to that scientific standpoint, I think my team really benefited from this deeper understanding of the Oregon coast that most of us had seen a lot of the areas from the shore or done little boat trips here and there. But this true synoptic big levels picture, I think it's going to really make us better scientists and really gave us a special opportunity. But this is the thing we all wanted to look at. So what I have here on the left are acoustics, the green is the fish, um, the gray is just background, and then on the right is the video. This is not actually from this current survey, this is from previous work we did at Redfish Rocks. Um, like I said, we just finished the survey about two weeks ago. We have not had time to start processing this data. Um, and these are a one-to-one -one relationship. The acoustics you see on the left are the video that is on the right. So you can see here's a nice school of black rockfish. Here's a nice school of deacon rockfish on the backside of a pinnacle on top of a pinnacle, an even bigger school of deacon rockfish. So this is really cool. It works. We can see these fish. I can get you links. I can get species comps out of all this. This is really neat stuff. But as many of you know, living on the coast, we, you know, this summer we had all these issues with our hypoxia being bad again. Um, we saw this with our CTD. We experienced it. Um, you can see here on the top left, here's my oxygen values for my CTD in real time. 1.28 milliliters per liter near the bottom. That's pretty bad. That's epoxic. Um, you can see a dead zone effect over here of uh, crabs that are going. And we really saw basically low oxygen events from the Columbia River down to about heck and a head. Um, this decidedly, we didn't see as many fish as we hypothesized we would. So we think this had a big effect on us. We did see some behavioral effects that we'd never observed in fish before. So there were definitely some impacts from hypoxia. However, you know, we got the biggest CTD uh, data set I know of for the near shore for hypoxia. We have video to go with it. We have this really great uh, data set from an ecological standpoint to better understand hypoxia. But from the fishery survey standpoint, it's not ideal. So what are we doing? Um, on the right, you have a plot of oxygen um, from the OOI buoy at Yaquina Head. And you can see the black lines above that red line, the red lines where I drew hypoxia, suggesting that we're out of this hypoxic event, at least in that area right now. So what we're doing is we're actually redoing all of these Central Coast transects. We're going to redo 135 of them, uh, starting at Three Arch Rocks. We'll do Cape Kiwanda, and then we're going to do Cascade Head continuously all the way to Waldport. Um, 
my team's out there right now. Um, the hope is that you know by re-getting this data, we'll also we'll get a really cool thing where we'll get to compare how hypoxia affects a fish survey, um, in addition to also getting a good fish survey data set in here. So um, a lot more time at sea, but I think it's going to really actually make this a pretty ecologically and uh, fisheries important type data set. Um, I hope I can come back in the future and tell you a little bit more about what the data is. Like I said, we just finished this. My email's at the top if you have any questions or want to ask anything. And if you want a really cool look at the boat and things like that of what we did, if you go on YouTube and Google uh, Black Rockfish Survey, you'll get to uh, see kind of a walkthrough I did with uh, some of our um, information officers. Thank you very much.